So my name is Jim Meyer, and uh, this session is on integrating your Sojo app with artificial intelligence, but I think you can probably read that. Um, I'm going to actually start this session, unlike many, with a demo. And what I'm going to do is using Amazon artificial intelligence services, I'm going to show a couple things. The first thing is probably one of the most controversial issues with artificial intelligence, at least at this point, which is machine vision and particularly video facial recognition. I'm also going to take that same video and take the audio track from it and convert it to text. I'm going to translate the text from, in this case, English to Spanish, which is the only other language I understand and can figure out whether it's right or not. And then we're also going to comprehend that text. And the video we're going to use is last year's uh, XDC promotional video, which I literally stole off the website. I captured it by playing it. Uh, so the quality isn't great. And that's somewhat intentional because I want to show how uh, strong this technology is. So let's jump out of here. And we've got this, this app. I've already built it, so I'm running out of the built version of it. And uh, up at the top here, the big black area is a movie player with a, uh, a canvas over the top. We've got a couple labels below for English and Spanish. And then what we've got is what I call the Dirty Dozen. Uh, these are people that, I was going to call it the, the FBI's 10 most wanted, but then I thought, no, I shouldn't do that. And there's 12, yeah. So. Um, and these are people that attended last year. Some of them are, many of them are Sojo staff members, but uh, a few that aren't. Uh, and these were also just harvested from web pages. Nobody sent me high resolution photos or anything like that. Uh, Kevin's uh, upper left hand corner, people who know Kevin Cully who didn't make it this year, uh, that's his um, avatar on the forum, on the Sojo forum. So it is not high quality stuff. Um, over on the right, there's a uh, list box that's going to show some metadata as I hit play. And hopefully this all works right. And you can hear the sound and everything. And maybe some of you recognize the, uh, this session. Well, it's great to see you all again. Um, so we know that voice. Here in Denver. Notice it's pulled out this year. didn't pick up Dana or Elisa. Coming to XTC, you just meet Finds Kevin there, from Travis. Uh, that have made all kinds of apps, things that you probably haven't even thought of. Jason, <laughs> the three blind mice. I found this to be one of the most relevant groups of developers that I've ever encountered. <laughs> I didn't have, I couldn't find a picture of Karen, and I didn't want to just steal one from the video because I think that's cheating. It's been interesting now that I'm We get Justin in the background there. XTC, uh, going to sessions and talking to people, learning from all kinds of different experiences and apps, just kind of figuring out the way people actually use the product in the real world uh, has actually led directly to some improvements in Zodra. The value, I think, Doesn't get Jeff there. The Not enough face. You There's Kim. Gotcha. On the forums, and you can talk to me on Twitter or Facebook. But the now Justin's coming up. It doesn't catch him right there. Relationship that way, that is so much more worthwhile than anything that could happen online. I really love doing this for you. We love seeing you guys. Oh, I, I edited it down just because the original was like three minutes long, and I thought that was a little too long. And everything worked right. Cool. Um, now let's just look at some of the metadata here that that I collected here. And um, what we've got, first of all, this is the first time it, it found Jeff. And uh, so it was Jeff PNG was the name of the file that, it, that I found. The 100% is a real important thing. Uh, every time you do stuff with artificial intelligence, pretty much, machine learning especially, you get a confidence number. How well did that? Um, I, I think I've got. Okay. So the hundred percent says it was a hundred. The model said it's a hundred percent sure that that was Jeff. 
and hmm? <laughs> um, and you'll see here, even with those low quality images, almost everything is 100%. I mean, here's one where it said 99.9%. I don't think there's anything under 99%. The ones in bold are the first time it spotted those individuals, and so on. This is kind of redundant at this point. And um, then I told you at the end we're going to comprehend or annotate the text. And the first thing I did is I told it to go out and get the general sentiment of the text, which was from the audio. And it said it was positive. And you, if you go back through, you see everybody said positive things and things, stuff like that. Uh, location, Denver. Why that's only 47%, I don't know, because it's pretty obvious that Denver was the location. I don't think it's confusing John Denver or something. Um, this year is a date. Uh, two and a half months, quantity. 52% quantity. Organizations, Twitter and Facebook. It's pulling all this from the text and identifying it. Um, now, a few mistakes here. It's 99% sure that Somebody said XTC instead of XDC. Now, pretty understandable that that kind of thing can happen. Now, I'm going to have to zoom. Is there a way to scroll, move the whole thing up? Well, I don't have a mouse. All I have is a trackpad. <laughs> ah, OK. Oh, cool. Yeah, all right. Duh. Ooh. Okay, um, the other obvious mistake here is Sojo instead of, you know, but what do you expect? Now, in a lot of cases, uh, I'm not sure about this service I was using here, you can add your own, own items in, uh, your own dictionaries. So it could actually correctly identify that. So anyway, there's another, that's the demo. Um, yes? That's all coming back from the service. Oh, is that my data or is that coming back from the service? And that was all coming back from the service. And Jim, was that literally live right now? Is hitting Amazon? Uh, I'll get to that. Part of it was, part of it wasn't. And okay, so machine learning. What's machine learning? Machine learning is the most common type of artificial intelligence. Now, if you ask me about the other types of artificial intelligence, well, please don't ask me because I don't know. Um, uh, there's things like fuzzy logic and stuff like that. I don't know anything about that stuff, to uh, be honest with you. Um, and really what machine learning is all about is these systems are coded to learn rather than perform a specific task. That's what it's all about. And if you want to learn a lot more about this, uh, there's quite a few, um, uh, there's a lot out there. Uh, you know, there's YouTube videos, you go to Google's website or Amazon's website, there's lots of information. One thing in particular is, this is a YouTube video that it's only about 10 minutes long. And if you want to get just your kind of your foot, feet in the ground here and understand generally what this stuff does, this is a really good video. Um, I, you know, for me, this stuff is kind of like Sojo's framework and compiler. I know it's there, and I know it works, and I know how, how to make it work, you know, hit the build button or the run button, but I don't know what's going on underneath, just like I don't know with the compiler and stuff. Um, if you want to do some fun, hands-on stuff, and this is brand new, um, it, take a look at Amazon's Deep Racer, and I'll give you the URL in a sec. And what this is all about is training scale model racing cars to go around a track. And it's all done with artificial intelligence. And this is what the car looks like. Hopefully you can see that. Um, that that's actually the front of the car. It looks like the back of a car, but it's the front. And that little circle in the middle is an HD camera. It's also got an accelerometer, a gyroscope, an atom processor with four gigs of memory, and it's got uh, two batteries, one that uh, drive the electronics, one that drives the car. Um, it's got Wi-Fi, it's got USB ports, all sorts of stuff. Um, you can buy this car for 400 bucks, uh, available on 
Amazon. Uh, they don't, they're not actually shipping yet. There's, I think last I checked, they're shipping in July. But you don't have to buy the car because you can just run it all in a simulator. In fact, as you're developing it, that's how you're going to do it. And keep in mind, the tracks that you run around are all different. So it's not like you can say, you know, go five feet and turn left and, you know. It has to actually visualize the track in front of it to determine how it's supposed to go. So it's pretty cool. And they have a whole tutorial series that you can go through that teaches you how to teach the car. So kind of a fun way to do it. And they're going to have competitions. Uh, all the different Amazon uh, uh, conferences, they're having competitions. And the leaders in both the actual car competition and the simulator advance to the big Amazon convention in Las Vegas, I think sometime in the fall. Uh, for more information, go to Amazon.com Deep Racer. Um, and this thing uses what's called TensorFlow. And if you start working with artificial intelligence, you're going to see the word TensorFlow all over the place. And what is TensorFlow? Well, it's a machine learning library that was originally developed by Google, but now it's open source as of November uh, 2015. And based on other people's research, like Gartner and people like that, it seems like this is well over 50% of the marketplace. Everybody, IBM offers TensorFlow uh, services, Amazon does, Google does, and so on. And if you're familiar with the AlphaGo project, where they taught computer to play Alpha or uh, play, play Go, uh, that was all done with TensorFlow. It's actually all written in C++, but it's typically implemented with Python. And uh, you can download a Mac, Ubuntu, which I would think it runs under other Linux besides that, Windows, and believe it or not, Raspbian. Um, and if you want to know more about TensorFlow, go to tensorflow.org. And I'm kind of wondering, like, talk Christian into taking a look at this to make a plug-in. It'd be kind of interesting. Now, machine learning actually takes two steps. There's a learning step and a deployment. The deployment they call an inference. Why, I don't know, but that's what everybody calls it. Um, the learning side of it, which is really building a mathematical model, is very processing intensive, uh, extremely. Um, the complex models really require petaflop type speeds. And even at that, training takes days and weeks. Uh, it's just incredibly intensive processing. And one of the big advances in the last couple of years uh, that's really moved some of this forward is dedicated custom hardware, um, particularly the TPU, the tensor processing unit. Uh, this is something that Google has on their racks that get accessed by different uh, by these services, and these things are amazing. Uh, you look at a picture of it, and it's got plumbing on it because it's liquid cooled. I mean, this is supercomputer type stuff. Microsoft and Intel are also in this space doing some, uh, some heavy research. So the model building is really ideal for the, for the cloud because you don't want to buy your own tensor processing unit or your own power substation to run it. Um, you can also scale as required um, with the cloud computing, of course. There's no infrastructure required. And you pay as you go. So you build your model. You don't have to pay anymore once the model's done. The deployment side of it is very lightweight. It doesn't take a lot to, uh, to deploy. And the deployment, again called an inference, you really have two options. You can leave your model up in the cloud and access it there, or you can download it to what, we, what is commonly known as edge. And the edge is defined as where the processing, where, where the data was acquired. For example, DeepRacer is an edge device. I can't take a, an image from that camera, send it up to the cloud, get it back even two, three seconds later to tell me to turn left. At that point, I'm already off the track. So if latency, connectivity, security, cost, if those things are a concern, then you deploy your model on the edge. If it's not, it's probably better off up in the cloud. So as I said, you build your model in the cloud, deploy on the edge. Now, for deploying on the edge, what kind of options do we have? Well, Apple has built into iOS and OS X uh, Core ML, is what they call it. 
And Christian actually has a plugin that will access Core ML for, uh, for Mac OS. And if, if I don't babble too much here and I have enough time, I can actually demonstrate a model that uh, I pulled down from the web and, and, um, or from the, from the cloud um, and show you how that works. Uh, Windows has Windows ML. You may be able to access this with declares. I'm not quite sure. I didn't, haven't done that. And then there's things like uh, Google's Edge TPU. Again, tensor processing unit. Again, the name tensor keeps coming up. And there goes my battery. Um, this is a device that kind of looks like a Raspberry Pi. Costs about $150, but it's a little heavier duty than a Raspberry Pi. There's a big, huge heat sink on it with a fan. <laughs> so it, it's doing some heavy stuff. And you down your model to that, and it's got pins, GPIO, GPIO pins, and you can turn things off and on, and you can you know, uh, hook it up to a camera and have it look at something and say, well, this is a bad part, or this is a good part in a manufacturing facility, things like that. But it's also coming down um, even to the hobbyist level. For example, Spark Fund, Spark Fun has Spark Fun Edge. For $15, you can buy this board, and you probably can't see it, but uh, it says that in the etching, in the, uh, the silk screening at the bottom, it says um, uh, powered by TensorFlow. Here we go again, here's TensorFlow. And this board basically has TensorFlow built into it, and you can download your models, it has a camera input, it has microphones, and you can use this to drive sorting devices, robots, whatever else you may want to do. The big players in the cloud uh, AI are Amazon, Google, IBM with Watson and that, and Microsoft Azure. There are certainly others, and uh, Oracle, some other people like that, and there's a lot of companies that specialize in particular areas. And they really offer two levels of service. What I call grow your own uh, is the first level. And this is where you develop a, a, a model, a mathematical model from your own data. So you're a big bank and you want to look for credit card fraud or something like that. Um, this, is, this is how you go. Um, and there's a lot of these uh, grow your own cloud services available. Your choice is really dependent on the type of data you have and your knowledge level. And the type of data is like, if you have structured data, like database data, that you'd use a different service than if you have images or video. Um, your knowledge level, building models is quite complex. Um, and some of these services uh, uh, expose all that complexity and you have to make the decisions on what to do, what kind of regression analysis you want to do and so on. But other services, they do all that for you. They optimize it or they just pick one of the other. And one of the easiest places to start, which I hopefully I'll have time to demo here in a bit, um, is uh, Google's AutoML. I'll show that in a bit. Um, I need to keep moving here quick. Um, there's also pre-trained pre -trained services, which is all about machine communications. And we've seen some of this already in the demo that I did. Uh, in text processing, comprehension, we've seen that. Converting text to speech language translation. On the audio front, te audio to text, which again, we've all seen. And we can do kind of a combination of all this, which it really is chatbots, either audio or text-based chatbots. Amazon has a service called Lex, which gives you access to the, Ale the, the Alexa engine. And again, I can demo this if I don't babble on too much. Um, you can actually build your own chatbots and access them from your Sojo project or your build. Uh, Google has a product called Dialogflow, which is basically the same thing. Going on to more pre-trained services, the machine vision, which we've seen a little bit, and I'll just jump through this real quick because we'll go see these in a little more detail shortly. So how do we access this stuff with, with Sojo? Um, there's a REST API like everything else in the cloud. Um, for both the grow your own and the pre-trained. So you create a JSON request, you post it or get it via HTTPS, and you get back this big, huge, monstrous JSON thing, uh, depending on what you're doing. It can be really deeply nested and huge. The one for that video is, uh, it had over 7,000 uh, elements in the array. Um, so you really need to get some kind of JSON visualizer, uh, 
uh, editor because it's real easy to get confused as to where things are at. The JSON response hopefully has what you requested. It could be translated text, it could be audio, just a pure audio stream, and it's often metadata. And as we've seen, you often get bounding box information. That video I showed, Google or Amazon, they don't modify your video. They just send you back the metadata and you have to render the video with, with the boxes or whatever you want. And um, in the case of video and audio, you also get a timestamp to tell you where in the video those, those events occurred. You also, as I mentioned before, get a confidence level. How well does your data match the model? If it's down below 90%, it's not real reliable. If it's up in the 90s, it's probably much better. You may also get back a batch or job number because all these services are not synchronous. Some are synchronous and some are batch. If the data is under five megabytes, usually you can do it synchronously. You send out the request and within a few seconds you get back a response. But for larger files, including audio and video, and this is gonna answer Bob's question, you have to do a batch. And the truth now is out that the demo I did originally was a batch. I, that data was all acquired and developed a couple weeks ago. So all I was doing during that demo was rendering it. Um, so typically what I had to do is I uploaded the, the video along with all those headshots, the dirty dozen, up to S3 buckets, and then I issue a job request with URLs to those different pieces, and then you wait. And in the case of that video, it took about 15 minutes before I got it back. Uh, and then you download the results and you can work with the results. Some services can be either sync or batch, depending. Um, so Amazon versus Google. Uh, there's a lot of similarity, but there's also a lot of differences. Uh, each has its strengths and weaknesses. Um, but the cool thing is that the free tier lets you experiment. Um, and because things are constantly changing in this world, that's really a good idea, is to go in there and use the free tier and find it. I, I just got a bill from Google for 36 cents. So this stuff is really pretty cheap. You can play around with it very easily. Um, both provide a free SDK for most all the common languages, uh, except, of course, Sojo. Um, and the documentation is really good for, uh, and they're good examples if you're using the SDK. If you're not, eh, it's a little more difficult. And especially with Amazon, their documentation used to be really, really bad when I first started on this, um, but it's, it has gotten better. The hardest thing really to do is the authorization, you know, the, your keys and things like that, and I'll get into that in a little bit, if you're not using the SDK. If you're using the SDK, authorization is really simple. They both integrate, the, the AI services both integrate with all their other cloud services. Their database, their uh, uh, virtual instances, you name it, they, it all integrates together including the billing and the security and all that. There's no monthly minimums. If you don't use the service, you don't get charged. Uh, as I mentioned, they both have pretty cheap, pretty good offers, free tier and introductory offers. And Google gives you a $300 credit when you sign up that you can use within the first year. I got down to about $290. So give you an example of cost for translation, the first megabyte a month, a year, a month is free. After that, you pay only $15 uh, a megabyte. Um, now, Amazon used to be that one of the two languages had to be English. So if you're going from German to Spanish, you had to go German to English and then English to Spanish. So it kind of doubled the cost. But they've eliminated that requirement in the last few months. So it's really 15 bucks a month. Um, Google is a little more expensive, but I think their translations are a little better based on my limited experience. Um, and they also charge for auto detection. Uh, both of these systems, you can pass it up a file of text and it will figure out what language it is for you. Uh, to set up a Google, you go into cloud.google.com, you set up an account which is free, you create a project, uh, you get an API key and or an OAuth access token for the project. 
And then you have to enable the API for, that, for the services that you want to use in that, in that project. So it's kind of a, an opt-in type thing. The authorization, some services allow you to simply use the API key as a URL parameter. So I got my URL question mark key equals my key. And it's that simple. That's really easy. But there's no security in that. Others, you have to use an OAuth access token, which is a little more involved. You have to get the user to sign in. You got to get an access token, which then you pass in the request header. Um, the thing is, the tokens expire in one hour. Um, but they're actually pretty easy to, uh, to update. And you don't require user authorization every time you update an existing token. Uh, for Amazon, it's similar. You create an account, and probably a lot of you already have Amazon accounts. You have to have a group and at least one user, and you get an access key and a secret key for that user. So it's more user-based than project-based. And you opt out of services. So you can t say, this user, I'm not going to let them use uh, some machine vision uh, AI, whatever. Um, the authorization is really ugly. Uh, you have to use what's called AWS Signature 4. And what's AWS Signature 4? Um, you pass it as either a URL parameter or, or in the request header, and it's, a, it's a, a, a hash of the keys mentioned above, the headers that that service requires, the date and time, and the actual request that you're making. So it's really unhackable. Um, and they expire in five minutes. Um, this is an outline of, and you know, if you, I know you can't see it, you don't need to see it because you don't want to know. Um, it's, it's a hash of the hash of the hash. It's just, a, it's a nightmare. The good news is that I've done all this for you and I think it works and I've developed classes that take care of all this for you. And you get copies of these. Um, the, the classes that I'm using or that I wrote, uh, they're all classic framework except for URL connection, which I just changed about two, three weeks ago. Uh, no plugins required. Um, it does require 2019 R1 because of some issues in their first release of URL connection. Um, they're not nearly as complete as the SDKs. Uh, I'm not that crazy. Um, they're really pretty easy to modify. And each one in the main method includes a link to the service documentation. So it's really easy to go see what else you might be able to do with that service. It includes all the authorization for Amazon, for Google, for both OAuth and API key with automatic renewal. Okay, last slide. Not doing too bad here. Um, we did start a little late, right? Okay, so... Let's take a look. I'm not going to be able to get through all my, all my demos, I can tell you that. So maybe we prioritize it. Um, one of the things I, I was going to show, and you know, I'll get a feel for whether you want to see this or not. I have a, a, an app that will translate your dynamic constants, now called localized strings, in your project and make your project more localized. You want to see that? OK. All right. Sounds like that's, that's something people want to see. So let's start up that app. You're all getting copies of this. First thing it does, it says, warning. This is use at your own risk because we're going in kind of the back door and we're modifying files without the, uh, without the IDE. And so all bets are off. I think I'm doing this right. I may be not. I may be missing things. I may be screwing up things. It's, it's up to you. First thing you got to do is you choose which service you want. Google or Amazon. Google has a lot more languages and it's faster, and that's typically what I what I use. Um, it that radio button will the, those two elements in the radio button will activate based on whether you've given it those the keys required for that service. And then what you do is you go and select your project. Now the project has to be saved as text as the text project type. Can't be the XML. Can't be the binary. And what I've done is I've saved the Eddie's Electronics project in that format. And so all I have to do is select the folder that, that includes the, all those elements. And when I do that, it immediately comes up and it lists for me all the modules that could have the constants. Uh, yeah. 
Uh, that's control, right? Yeah, I see that. Just move your mouse over to the come in and move your mouse over to the You got it. All right. Thanks. Is that better? Okay. Okay. So when Paul wrote this, he did a really nice job of putting all the dynamic constants now called uh, local localized strings in this one module. And I click on that through regex, Ken would be proud of me. Uh, it goes out and it finds them all, okay? And one of the things it does here, which um, is really obsolete with 2019, it found two of them that were not marked as dynamic. And I could jump to the project now, but I'm, I'm not gonna do that. Um, and I could show you there was a little slider, a little uh, a Boolean slider that uh, you had to turn on to tell it that it was a dynamic constant, not just a regular constant. Now, because they're two different things, it shows them separately so you can find them. But if we look through here, these two, the two ones in bold are not, that slider is in the wrong position. But I'm not gonna mess with that right now. Now, w the only strings that it listed here, it listed 58, are the ones that currently we don't have a Spanish version of. So it only lists the things that there is no Spanish for any platform. You can also pick which platform you want. So if I pick a different language, let's say I'm going to do Russian, because I know that works pretty fast. Um, notice it went to 104. There's 104 dynamic constants that aren't currently translated into Russian. And when I'm going to go ahead, and I'm just going to translate them, I'm going to do it right now. And it comes up with a warning, says, don't depend on this. Uh, I'll we we'll talk about that while it's going. You can see now it's counting up. It's going through. It's sending uh, each one of those is a request for each one of those, those constants to translate it. You can see it's almost halfway through already. Is this uh, right now in real time? Yes, this is real time. Um, now, um, both Google and Amazon really want full sentences because it uses the context of the sentence to determine how to translate the word. The best example I can come up with is in Eddie's electronics is the word state. Okay, state of Michigan, state of Florida, whatever. Well, state also means state of the union, solid, liquid, or gas. So which one do you want if all you have is state? So you really have to, have to deal with this. Uh, this is not perfect. Um, now, so here's all my Russian translation. Now I can click on any one of these, and I can go edit it. Of course, I, you may be able to, I can't, um, if you want. One enhancement you could put in here is be able to export this somehow and send it to somebody, have them fix it up and bring it back, whatever. The other thing I can do here is I can check sizes. And if I click this button, what it's gonna do, it goes out and it checks all these control types, which are not all of them. And by the way, this is kind of a work in progress. It checks for labels, push buttons, bevel labels, checkbox, radio button, and group box, and any um, subclasses of those, which in this case, base push button is one of them, is one that Paul created. And it tells you, it says four of them are undersized. And if I look through here, here's one of them. Okay, it's in bold. And if I copy that line, and now I'm going to have to uh, get back to my... Uh, my project here. And if I open up Eddie, and I open up the project, geez, so Pete time flies fast. Um, if I do a find and a paste, it found where that is. I can double click on it. And there, see, this is not going to be long enough. So I can try and make it bigger, you know, if I want. If I make it bigger, uh, let's make it really big, you know, obvious. And I save. And if I come back here, it 
and I checked my size again, it didn't, it, the bowl disappeared. So I now have that field big enough. Now, at this point, all I have to do is hit accept, and it's done. And if I go back to my project here. So again, just, just to be clear, when mm -hmm. you check size again, that was working off cache data, right? That's what the, oh, is that oh, you're right. I should have saved. Well, you're right. The question was, it was working off cache data. Um, I, I should have, well, let me think. No, no, it's okay. It, it wrote back to the file. No, yeah, no. There's no cloud for, for checking size. Okay. I'm just doing that totally locally. The only thing I'm using cloud for is the, is the translation. So if I come down here and I go to shared, and I make my default language, I wish this was in alphabetical order, by the way, guys. And I make my default language Russian. And I come back up here and, and go to this. Oh, I know, I didn't save. Um, I'm, it's, oh, I know what I need to do. I just need to close this. Don't save. And now I gotta go find my, and reopen it. Go to my shared. Go to Russian. Ah, sorry. Uh, here's Russian. This is a real pain. It's Russian. Okay. All right. So we spent too much time on that because I got a lot more to show. I'm really pushing it, aren't I? Hmm? <laughs> I'm not even close to. Yeah. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to narrow this down a little bit and let's just go to. This is an app that I think I can probably shrink this down now, hopefully. Can you still see the, at least the, my text? Okay. This, this started just, this app started just as Translate. And it just grew as I started adding more things. So it's kind of a little bit of a mess. But we're going to run this. And I just want to show a few things. OK. Uh, what I wanted to show is, is how when it translates, it gets the contextual aspect correct. So we have vampire bat and we have baseball bat in the same sentence. If we translate it to English to Spanish, which is the only language I know, other language I know, um, this murcielago is, in fact, a a, 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 the bat that flies around. And bate de baseball is a baseball bat. Okay, so it understands the context. Um, another interesting thing here: if I speak this, um, listen to the date. The vampire bat was about to bite her on the neck, so I hit it with my baseball bat on the first of February, eighteen. Okay, first of February, right? Because that's an Australian voice. If I go to a U.S. voice and I speak that. The vampire bat was about to bite her on the neck, so I hit it with my baseball bat on the 2nd of January, 18. So it knows the day context there. Um, we can annotate this text, okay? It pulls words out. We've kind of seen this. We get the date, and the fact that this date is in, in um, parentheses here indicates that um, I was able to use the parse date function and that it worked, and I got the correct date. Now, other stuff I can do here. Um, 
let's do some samples here. These are some other services. Let's grab this. Okay. We've just detected faces. We've got face number one, and I, it's a little hard to see. It drives a, bo a bounding box around her face, and it gives you all this information about her face. And then face two is Ozzy. Um, we can also do things like landmark detection. If I grab that, it properly identifies that as the pyramids of Giza. Um, we have things like logo detection, which I cannot get to work very well. In this case, it says Napa Auto Parts, but there's all sorts of other logos on that car. And why it doesn't pick those up, I do not know. Jim? Yes, sir. Uh, I might be a little slow on the uptake, but can you tell us when you drop that picture, what's actually happening behind the scenes? There's a rest request. <laughs> there, <laughs> sorry. Um, what happens behind the scenes when I drop that picture? Um, the, the picture, I'm reading in the picture, converting it to the string, the you know, the, the binary to base 64, throwing it into a JSON object, passing it up, waiting for the results. And that's all happening right now in real time? Correct. Now, this picture here, you'd think it would find the Nike logo. It doesn't. To me, that's kind of beyond belief. Um, since I'm running out of time, I'm going to jump down to this here. My, my wife, um, is a member of a genealogy, French American Genealogical Society, and they have books full of pages like this. Uh, these are, this is newspaper clippings of obituaries, and um, they want to digitize all this. And Google has this service here, document text detection, and it's really OCR. And if I grab this and drop it in here, it goes and it OCRs the whole document. Okay? Now, the, weird, the, the problem here for these guys is that it reads this wrong. It reads across the columns. And so, in an obituary, this is the worst thing in the world because I'm, missing, I'm mixing up these obituaries. Um, so what I was able to do, because it doesn't just give me the text, it gives me the, the bounding box or the location of every single word and the confidence it is that that word is correct. Because some of these words, you know, this is old newsprint and it's fading and, and it's hard to read. So I can go through and I can highlight the words that are less than 99% uh, confidence for the librarian and then I can reassemble this document in the correct order. And then once we do that, with my magical little thing, I can take this button, paste that, takes that text and throws it up there. And then I can annotate that text. And bingo, that was all real time, by the way. And it, it breaks down. Here's the people's names, locations, uh, dates, everything. So for indexing, and for the genealogist, this is just, just awesome. So I'm pushing the time here. So uh, I've got tons more stuff. If somebody wants to collar me at some point, I can show you AutoML. Uh, I can show you how to build your own model. I can show you all sorts of stuff. Um, you know, I'm here all day today. I don't leave till tomorrow. So questions? Kim. No. You get back a batch number. Or the qu <laughs> I'll never remember that. Thank you. Um, the question is, when you do a batch job, do you have to poll? And the answer, poll to find out whether it's done. Um, you, you get a batch number, and then you do have to ask for 
for the, uh, you, we ask it and it will come back and say it's not ready or it's ready. So yes, you do pull it to find out. You can set up through you know, all the integrated services uh, that Google or, or Amazon to send you an email when it's done. You could do that if you wanted. The, those don't take very long. Uh, Does it give us a time estimate? No. No, it doesn't give you a time estimate. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm out of time here, so uh, went slower. We got started a little late. That didn't help, but I babbled on. Yes, another question? Maybe you could um, do, like, some uh, little individual videos yourself to augment what they're going to post up on the, the, the site. It, it kind of just goes over the material you didn't have a chance to uh, yeah, I could, I could turn. Um, yeah, I can do that. I, the other thing is, um, I don't know what the timing is. Maybe, maybe the at uh, you know quarter after twelve or something. You know, most people are done with lunch a lot quicker. I can, I can show you more stuff. I was going to show source code. I, you know, but okay, like twelve fifteen or something like that. I'll. I'll I'll be available. I mean, I don't want to interrupt other, you know, if, if you're not going to another session and I'm not, I, that's fine, but I, I'd like to go to some of the sessions, so that's so why I'm here. So anyway, uh, thank you, and uh, sorry I babbled on too much.